That's the trash. These are your friends. Cartoons. They're just for kids, right? Whether CGI or hand-drawn, it's just harmless content for babies, right? Wrong! The history of animation is as rich, complex, and weird as any other visual medium. And while there is certainly plenty of animation made for adults, even the animation that is ostensibly for the kids can work on multiple levels. In this video, we're going to be looking at the moments in animated movies that went straight over children's heads, but which the adults in the audience definitely noticed. How could I not listen? It is wild to think that way back in 1995, nearly 30 years ago, the Pixar brand crashed onto our screens basically fully formed. Oh, and a bunch of jokes that were definitely not for kids. This will come to be a recurring theme across all the Toy Story entries on this list. All the Pixar entries, in fact. And it's not even the only one in this movie. But it is a great illustration of Pixar scripts working on multiple levels. Buzz Lightyear has just arrived in Andy's room and is taking all the attention from Woody. The jealous cowboy insists that he is a toy just like them. T-O-Y. Toy. Buzz responds that he thinks the word Woody is searching for is Space Ranger. Woody's retort? The word I'm searching for, I can't say because there's preschool toys present. Aged eight, that went right over our heads. As adults, we realized that Woody wanted to call Buzz a <laughs> or maybe a or even a <laughs> eh, maybe in the director's cut, huh? Considering it's based on a book for young children that doesn't really have much of a story beyond food inexplicably starts falling from the sky, it's impressive that the Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs movie was as fun and inventive as it was. Part of the movie's appeal is the cleverness and weirdness of the script, and the fact that there's just as much for adults to enjoy as kids. Of course. For example, remember the part when all the presidents on Mount Rushmore get hit with a pie in the face? Except not all of them do. Abraham Lincoln gets hit with a pie, but it hits him in the back of the head. Why? Well, if you're a student of history, this dark visual gag will make sense. You know, one for the assassination buffs out there. You know who you are. Oh no! John Wilkes Booth! Hasta la vista, baby. The Shrek series is well known for being a subversive take on fairy tales. It was basically conceived as a giant middle finger to Disney from producer Jeffrey Katzenberg, after all. Throughout the first Shrek, eagle-eyed viewers will notice a silent mini-story playing out involving the three bears. First of all, we see that the three bears have been captured by Lord Farquaad and are sitting sadly in cages awaiting their fate. Then, later, at Shrek's swamp, we see that Daddy Bear and Baby Bear are free, but Mama Bear is absent, and Baby Bear is crying. Cut to Lord Farquaad's bedroom, and we see a suspiciously familiar bearskin rug with a suspiciously familiar pink bow. Ah, <sighs> rip, Mama Bear, and rip our childhood innocence. Cast your mind back to How to Train Your Dragon 2, and the moment where one-legged Viking Gobber points to a squabbling married couple and says, This is why I never married. This and one other reason. That extra line was improvised by actor Craig Ferguson, and adult viewers always assumed it was meant to imply that Gobber is gay. And they were right. See? The Dragon movie is more progressive than you thought. Obviously, people love Lego. Obviously, people love seeing things they know made out of Lego. Like Batman, or Han Solo, or Ninjago, whatever the heck they are. But people also love scripts that include jokes for both kids and adults, and these movies deliver on that front as well. When Robin, aka Richard Grayson, meets Bruce Wayne, he asks that the billionaire playboy call him Dick. My name's Richard Grayson, but all the kids in the orphanage call me Dick. Well, children can be cruel. Yeah. Indicating that when he says Dick, he's talking about it as meaning, well, you know, you can guess. And if you think that there's something behind that, then you're crazy. We're back in Andy's room and the world of the Toy Story toys. This time, it's the iconic sequel, Toy Story 2, very much the Empire Strikes Back of Pixar sequels, and not just because of the no, I am your father joke. Buzz Lightyear, the square-jawed space hero who is always 100% confident, shyly approaches Jessie, the yodeling cowgirl, and nervously compliments her beautiful hair full of yarn. Jessie is in the process of thanking him when she notices that Buster the dog needs help, and she leaps into action, skateboarding and flipping and yodeling like the hero she is. In response, Buzz's wings, well, they pop up. You know, they're, they're suddenly raised and, and we guess you could say stiff? 
Golly. Uh, let's move on to our next entry. Hopefully this won't be the same sort of joke. Ah, geez. This is exactly the same sort of joke. The Emperor's New Groove is kind of a forgotten Disney classic. It came after the fabled Disney Renaissance, the production was famously troubled, and it wasn't a blockbuster hit like its predecessors. But it is one of the sharpest, weirdest, and most original entries in the Disney canon. For example, this scene where dim-witted henchman Kronk is camped out in the forest. As you can see, he's pitching a tent. Over his crotch area. Pitching a tent. Get it? Man, there's a lot of these sorts of entries. Hopefully the next one won't be crotch-related. Ah, oh, you've gotta be kidding. This one's about crotches too? Ah, well, I guess that's what we signed up for when we started this list. And it's kind of what you sign up for when you watch Rugrats, a show that's always had a lot more going on under the hood than just here's what babies get up to when adults aren't around. Take this scene where newborn babies compare surgical scars. One complains that their umbilical cord has been cut, while the other looks down inside his diaper and is dismayed to find evidence of some sort of procedure down there too. That's right, folks. It's a circumcision joke in the Rugrats movie. And now time for a joke about the female anatomy, just to mix things up a bit. Yes, we're back with Pixar again. It's almost like the magical factory that produces iconic and beloved children's media is addicted to dirty jokes. This time, we're looking at Coco, the 2017 Pixar movie that made your entire family cry, especially your dad and whose art director seemingly invented about a hundred new colors to use in the movie. In one scene, Hector sings a song to Miguel, a jaunty acoustic number called Everyone Knows Juanita. But you may notice that at one point, Hector pauses nervously in the middle of a line, and when he continues with the song, the skeleton listening nearby complains, Those aren't the words. There are children present. Oh, this one's awful. It seems that the original lyrics do not in fact refer to Juanita's knuckles dragging on the floor. They refer to something else belonging to Juanita dragging on the floor, but Hector rightly decided that Miguel was not the ideal audience for the original lyric. We'll leave the rest to your imagination. Disney's 1997 animated Hercules is another underrated gem in our opinion, and once again, it's an excuse for the writers to sneak in hilarious jokes that undoubtedly went right over young viewers' heads. The joke we're focusing on? And then that, that play, that, that, that Oedipus thing? A throwaway line in the movie, and one that we didn't think much about as kids. But if you know your Greek tragedies, you'll know of the play Oedipus Rex by Sophocles, a cheerful production in which the titular King Oedipus blinds himself after murdering his father and, uh, let's say, setting up home with his mother. That's right, a hint of both incest and patricide. Way back in the first Despicable Me, the Minions weren't icons or a brand in themselves. They were just supporting characters in Gru's story. And Gru had his own jokes. Jokes that didn't even involve the Minions. Yes, amazing, we know. Take this sight gag, for instance, when Gru goes to get a loan from the Bank of Evil. Beneath the Bank of Evil sign, it says previously Lehman Brothers. This is, of course, a reference to the financial services provider Lehman Brothers, which was at the center of the 2007 subprime mortgage crisis. A symbol of excess and carelessness that screwed the pooch so hard it had to file for bankruptcy. Naturally, their next evolution would be giving loans to supervillains. If anything, that's less evil. And we're back with Pixar and the Toy Story series. Ever since the first movie, when Mr. Potato Head could be heard quietly begging for a wife, we've known he had, let's say, strong masculine urges. Seriously, Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head are way too horny considering these are ostensibly kids' films. And Toy Story 3 is no different. Check out the moment when lots of Hug and Bear rudely pulls off Mrs. Potato Head's mouth and her husband steps in to say, Hey, no one takes my wife's mouth, except me. Do we even want to think about what he might mean by that? You could be forgiven for forgetting this joke in the 2005 CGI animated movie Robots. Heck, you could be forgiven for forgetting about the 2005 CGI animated movie Robots completely. But let's talk about it. Near the beginning of the movie, a robot husband comes home to his robot wife. Sadly, she tells him that he missed the delivery of the robot baby. A fun gag, because their baby was literally delivered in a package ready to be assembled. Because, you know, they're robots. But then, when the robot husband is disappointed, his wife tells him not to worry because making the baby is the fun part. Gee, there really are a lot of sex jokes in these family comedies. Pixar, again? 
What is going on over there? Cars is famously nobody's favorite Pixar movie, so don't bother flooding the comments with pro-Cars propaganda, telling us your nephew loves it, or that you had Lightning McQueen bedsheets when you were a kid. We simply don't believe you. But regardless of that, it's still got the standard quota of risque jokes. Picture the moment when Lightning McQueen wins his race and is faced with a crowd of adoring fans, journalists, paparazzi, and so on. Two female fans, twins in fact, rush to the front, gushing about how much they love him. And, like fans at a rock gig, the twins flash their lights. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink, etc. Cast your mind back to 1992. The Disney Renaissance is in full swing. They're really leaning into their imperial phase. And they decide to cast Robin Williams as the genie in their new movie, Aladdin. Now, obviously, nowadays, we're used to big-name stars voicing characters in animated movies. Unfortunately for people like me, it's more common than hiring professional voice actors. But back then, this was a big deal. And there's a reason it became the norm, because Williams brought his A-game. But do you remember feeling confused by some of his dialogue? Well, that's probably because they just let Williams improvise for hours in the recording booth, leading to a string of vocal impressions that were kind of obscure then, and even more so now. All right, Sparky, here's the deal. Sure, you probably know Jack Nicholson. You might even be familiar with Groucho Marx. You should be, anyway. But Ed Sullivan? That really was one for the adults in 1992. In 2022? We're not sure it's for anyone. Yep, you guessed it. We're back with Pixar. Ratatouille is another entry from the kings of kids' animation that positively revels in throwing all sorts of jokes at the audience. It's a carnival of comedy, from slapstick to, well, whatever this next one is. The scene? Linguini is trying to explain to Colette what's going on with him. But being Linguini, he's doing it in the most awkward, stuttering, stammering way possible and leaving pauses in all the wrong places. So when he says, I have a little, I have a tiny, and then doesn't follow up with anything, it is no wonder that Colette's eyes momentarily flick downwards. Naturally, she thinks that he's trying to admit something very private and very embarrassing about his downstairs area. Come on, it's more likely than him saying he has a talking rat secretly pulling his strings. She's a practical woman. We have a special place in our hearts for Monster House, a surprisingly scary kids' horror movie that rarely gets acknowledged as a classic. It's well worth your time if you've never heard of it, and not just because it's got a lot of clever jokes, some of them dark, some of them dirty. Take this fun gag. The kids, as they move through the titular Monster House, have started to realize that the place is alive. One of them points out the uvula, which is part of the soft palate, indicating that they're in the beast's mouth, ready to be swallowed. Oh, one of the boys respond. So it's a girl house. Uvula, kid! Uvula! Not vulva! But hey, congrats on being so knowledgeable about female biology, I guess? Everybody knows the phrase, breeding like rabbits, yeah? Well, adults do. Maybe not kids. Hence this delightful blink-and-you'll-miss-it gag in Zootopia. Lovable junior cop Judy Hopps has chosen to wipe the smug smile from Nick Wilde's foxy face by calculating exactly how much he owes in evaded taxes. It's a great moment showing that little Judy is not to be underestimated, but she also slips in a fun double entendre. I mean, <laughs> I am just a dumb bunny, but we are good at multiplying anyway. Of course, here she means it in a math context. But uh, we know the other meaning, don't we? Pixar yet again! Inside Out, a painful and remarkable movie about the importance of sadness, the trauma of growing up, the power and mystery of memory, oh, and a throwaway joke about San Francisco's gay community, because why not? You might not have even picked up on the exchange, but you will now. The emotions are bickering away in their control room as they do. Fear, in his usual fearful way, is concerned that Riley will get eaten by a bear. It's a bear! There are no bears in San Francisco. I saw a really hairy guy. He looked like a bear. If you don't get it, well, maybe Google other potential meanings of the word bear. Uh, yeah. We'll wait. Well, we started with a Toy Story, so it seems only fitting that we end with a Toy Story. The fourth Toy Story, to be specific. And while our other entries for this series were dirty jokes, this one is more in the territory of, yikes, how do we explain this to our kids? You see, for kids, Forky's habit of diving into piles of trash desperate to return to the trash from whence he came is a funny sight gag. He keeps jumping into the trash. He keeps saying trash, it's funny. 
Trash? <laughs> no, no, toys. But we know why he's doing it, don't we, fellow adults? We know he's trying to escape the pain, the horror, the unending existential nightmare of consciousness, of being alive. There is a recognized official phrase for what he's doing, but we can't say it on YouTube. And uh, on that delightful note, will there be a Toy Story 5? Maybe. But how much darker can they really go? Everyone nearly died in the third one, and then Forky tried to end his own existence in number four. What are they gonna do, kill Andy? Oh God, they're gonna kill Andy, aren't they?